Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, some of you will know that uh, Gary Kasparov lives in New York today, as um, an exile from Russia. But, but, but I want to tell you that these Zabar's bagels that I have here are, in fact, some more swag from the winning bets the Kansas City Public Library had with the New York Public Library, the Toronto Public Library, and the Queens Public Library. And uh, with our book spine poetry slam, who knew that trash talking librarians could have so much fun? <laughs> For those of you who didn't see the the uh, fifth game, I think it was the fifth game. It was the sixth game of the of the of the championship series, uh, not the World Series, but the, the American League Championship Series. I think it was Joe Buck uh, described our our book spine poetry uh, slam and uh, contest and said uh, after after he described it, he said, "Librarians, calm down." Anyway, we're not, we're not calming down. I do want to mention a couple of upcoming programs before I introduce uh, Mr. Kasparov. Um, and uh, a particular special thing that we do uh, as a sort of introduction to the holiday seasons, we've been, been doing it for three or four years now, the Baccaria Soloists, our great local Baroque, professional Baroque uh, group, uh, and the uh, uh, Heart of America Shakespeare Festival get together um, and do a program for us that combines uh, Baroque music, Shakespeare era music, uh, and, uh, and Shakespeare. Uh, and uh, we'll be doing that. It's called One Touch of Nature, the Four Seasons, so we'll get a little Vivaldi, um, and uh, uh, w that's on uh, November 21st at the, at the Central Library uh, just before Thanksgiving. So I look forward to that. Um, and, uh, and then to prove that you know, we're, we're open to uh, all political persuasions, um, uh, and, uh, and I do want to make that very clear. We have people from right, left, and, and center uh, speaking in the library. I think you all know that. Um, we have uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, towards the end of the month, uh, we have um, da uh, daily briefings at the Northeast Branch of the uh, uh, Kansas City Public Library uh, through November 21st with a Sly James Law Firm. Uh, on uh, such topics as crimes and misdemeanors, the ticket that could cost you your job, immigration, your rights and responsibilities, and abandoned housing, how we can fix it together. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll take just about anybody in any point of view, and I think that proves that. Um, I do want to thank uh, the uh, Show Me Institute, which I chair, so I'm thanking myself, I guess, uh, uh, for being a sponsor uh, tonight. Show Me is a libertarian public policy think tank based in uh, St. Louis, um, and uh, it, there, there's information outside in the hall, um, and, uh, and the Singfield Charitable Trust, Rex Singfield. Those of you who uh, heard uh, Mr. Kasparov on uh, Steve Kraske's show, Steve finally said something nice about Rex. Um, and pointed out that, and I think it's Im important for you to know, uh, and Gary talked about it a little bit uh, on Kraske's show, uh, St. Louis has become the center of chess in the United States because of Res uh, Rex's charitable uh, contributions to the St. Louis Chess Club and Hall of Fame. In fact, uh, Gary Kasparov said uh, this morning on Steve's show uh, that it, uh, it's not only the center of chess in the United States, but maybe in the world. And that means a lot to the to the Kansas City Public Library, and I think most public libraries, chess is, is an activity that we have in the library. Seven or eight of our ten branches have had chess programs in my time as director. Um, they are particularly popular in our inner city branches, um, and it's a, it's a great activity. It's educational. It's obviously stimulating uh, of uh, intellectual activity. Uh, it's a great thing, and uh, Gary Kasparov is one of the things we're grateful to Gary for because he's been intimately involved with Rex in, in building a uh, American uh, chess programs for, for younger people. Um, so I thought you would be interested in that. Well, thank you. <laughs> if, I, I want to tell you, uh, uh, in introducing Gary Kasparov, I just want to talk a little bit about the news of the last few days. Um, if you were listening to NPR yesterday, you would have heard uh, the Supreme Commander uh, of, the Ally, of, the, of NATO uh, talk about why there are there's a need for uh, more American troops in in Europe. And he was echoed by the Secretary of Defense Ash Carter, um, and uh, they called for this because of the aggressive activities of Russian troops, not not just in the Ukraine and Crimea. You know about that uh, in Georgia, perhaps you know about that, but on the borders of Latvia and Lithuania uh, and other is Eastern European nations, uh, and uh, uh, as uh, 
the uh, 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 chief of staff of the United States Army, the current chief of staff, Mark Milley, said, uh, aggression left unanswered is likely to, re to lead to more aggression. Um, if uh, this summer you'd been looking at Newsweek, you would have seen this article uh, in uh, May, uh, I guess in May, uh, Vladimir Putin's budding bromance with China's Xi Jinping. Well, that's old news, but uh, in July uh, in Al Jazeera, interesting, Al Jazeera, Putin and Xi plot the future of Eurasia. And then, if you looked at the New York Times today, in case you think that's all old news, Page seven, today, U.S. strategy to end killing in Syria is met with doubts. For the first time in the four-year Syrian civil war, for the first time, President Obama is beginning to execute a combined diplomatic and military approach to force President Assad to leave office uh, and end the carnage. John Kerry will there, there, therefore have more leverage to put Russia, push Russia, Iran, and other players toward two objectives, cease fire and limit the killing. Even senior members of the administration, or these two New York Times reporters writing this, even senior members of the administration express doubts in private about whether the effort is sufficient. And that's just the news today. But there's also another article on page 10 about the Russian contempt for the United States uh, around this doping scandal in Russian sports. Why they should have contempt for us about their doping scandal, well, you figure that one out. Um, Gary Kasparov talks in this book, Winter is Coming, about Vladimir Putin as a performance artist. And you can sort of see that in the Russian reaction on the, on the doping scandal. But he attributes it, I think correctly, to the moral ambiguity, not just of American policy, but of Western policy, of the policy of any of the, the free world governments, as we used to call them during the Cold War. And it's one of the points of Winter is Coming that perhaps we are in another Cold War. Uh, and uh, that we need to grow up from our moral ambiguity. That engagement, which we talk about today, which is similar to containment, except not so similar to containment during the Cold War, uh, must have a moral purpose or it won't be real engagement and there will be no consequences uh, that we can live with. The last chapter in his book is entitled Timeless Values in a Shifting World. Uh, and I think that's the lesson uh, of the, the last few years in dealing with Russians and probably with the, the Chinese. Either, either we are defending our values uh, or we are letting their values or lack of values relative to freedom uh, 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 succeed. Um, Churchill called in, in the state of Missouri in 1946 uh, for a union uh, of the, the English-speaking peoples who at that point he thought were those freedom-loving uh, peoples uh, to counter the aggression that he saw as the, uh, the drop, dropping of the Iron Curtain uh, across Eastern Europe. Gary Kasparov has been warning about a similar thing happening uh, in Russia and uh, in the Middle East and in China uh, since the 1990s. Um, his call is for a union of liberal democratic states devoted to the value of human rights. He's been fighting for it uh, since the 1990s. He's endangered his life in doing that. He's had to become an exile because of that. Uh, and ultimately, what he's fighting for is the freedom that we hold very dear, and why should we let him fight alone? But here he is to tell you himself, Gary Kasparov. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, just heard the latest news. And uh, just a quick comment. It's about the New York Times article saying that uh, Obama's policy in, in the Middle East failed. And uh, I couldn't uh, resist the temptation to make a comment in my Twitter today, reading this, this article, uh, saying that you know, sending 50, 50 special operation, whatever the name is, to Syria is not going to solve anything. Somebody should tell Obama that Avengers are not real. But, uh, you know, when they say 50, I can tell you that there are more Russian TV crews in Syria, <laughs> not, ca not counting soldiers. Louder? I don't know. I have two mics, actually. They just... This is, 
I hope one of them is working. Is it? Okay, fine. So should I repeat? <laughs> okay, Obama sent 50 US special operation forces to Syria to, um, uh, to put pressure on Russia, and I, uh, again, I couldn't resist temptation to make a comment that um, someone has to tell Obama that Avengers are not real. <laughs> and uh, you know, if, if you have doubts about, you know, 50 soldiers, probably the most experienced, in Syria, I can tell you that Russia has more TV crews, <laughs> not, not counting, of course, soldiers and jets. Um, now, uh, as you can guess, it's if you glanced to the book or just heard this presentation or read, you know, followed my Twitter or Facebook or read stories, I'm an activist for democracy. And uh, as an activist, I'm um, not a big fan of kings, queens, monarchs, but here I must make an exception for the royals. <laughs> Uh, uh, but I have to confess, I'm so sorry that I, I tried to watch baseball, you know, and I have, to, I, actually I tried and I watched it in New York. <laughs> Not a very happy crowd. <laughs> but I quickly realized that you know, for me chess was much more exciting. But big congratulations anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, now um, back to the book. Um, so winter is coming. Um, it's not about climate, um, though uh, it is, you may call it, a change in geopolitical climate. And um, I picked up this title, and many could recall it was you know, uh, borrowing from uh, the great TV show and uh, great books, um, Game of Thrones. Um, and uh, in the books and in, in the show, uh, the winter is coming meant that we, we, we were facing, they were facing in the books, yes, um, dark and dangerous times ahead. And uh, that's, that's my geopolitical weather forecast. Uh, because history is not linear, history always goes in cycles. And now we are reaching another, you know, cold period, you may call, call it a cold war, uh, whatever the name is, but uh, it's a period of challenges. And the book, Winter is Coming is an attempt to analyze the last 25 years uh, from uh, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, to, um, to these days, where we suddenly we, we are facing dangerous challenges again. Uh, the book comprises three stories uh, under one cover. Uh, it's the rise and fall of um, Russian democracy from Gorbachev's retreat from Eastern Europe to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. I couldn't put up Syria there because it was not, it didn't happen. But uh, reading the book, you can understand that, you know, it was more or less predicted because I knew Putin would strike again, though I just, you know, I didn't know exactly where. Um, didn't have my crystal ball ready. Palantir, if we follow another uh, great, great uh, um, books. Um, and uh, uh, second is my personal perspective, uh, being a witness and in many cases a, a direct participant of many of these events. And the third part is probably most important uh, and most relevant. It's about um, um, the Western inaction, what the West did, or to be more precise, didn't do to prevent uh, these dangerous events from happening. Um, and uh, um, I could probably add, you know, just a few few words about, you know, my own uh, um, uh, life um, uh, history, because my life story, uh, because um, chess in the Soviet Union was a very important part of the <coughs> ideology. I would even say, it, you know, you may probably you may call it uh, an, a very powerful ideological tool to demonstrate the intellectual superiority of the communist regime over the decadent West. So that's why chess players, young chess players, talented chess players enjoyed, you know, uh, support from the state because the state had, a, uh, it had an interest of picking up young talents 
and making sure they could grow uh, up to become world-class players, eventually world, you know, one of them could be in the world champion. Um, and uh, um, uh, quite soon I discovered by climbing at these uh, stairs, you know, to the Chess Olympus, that uh, it was not just, it was not only about playing chess, because my ultimate match, ultimate challenge was Anatoly Karpov, the current world champion, the then world champion, who was on top for 10 years, who uh, took this crown from Bobby Fischer's hands. To be more precise, Fischer, Fischer walked away. But no matter what, Karpov was the world champion, and he was a darling of the system. Because by Soviet authorities, he seemed to be sort of a man who restored Soviet intellectual dominance in the world. He was congratulated by all Soviet officials, including uh, um, uh, General Secretary of Communist Party, Leonid Brezhnev himself. And uh, it was very clear that uh, the whole system was backing him um, against, okay, I was young, talented, I played at that time by the rules, uh, but I was half Armenian, half Jewish, from Baku. I used to say that, you know, in a, for American audience, that I was born and raised in the deep south right next to Georgia, <laughs> which is technically correct because Azerbaijan was a deep south of the Soviet Union right next to the Republic of Georgia. Uh, um, and uh, I think they, they, they realized fairly quickly that though I tried to be obedient, uh, but I was a rebel. And I just, they, they could sense that I was not the right man. While Karpov was a very loyal soldier of the party who followed instructions and always stayed with the government. Now, even 30 years after, you know, after our match in Moscow where I took the title from him, he still was the government. He's still a member of the parliament. So the Soviet Union has gone, you know, you have a new, though it's still old KGB, but uh, it, it's, it's, it's a new country. And Anatoly Karpov was still there with, with, with them, you know, fully backing whatever, you know, whatever, the, whatever the party line is today. Um, and uh, um, facing Karpov was a big challenge, and uh, I was probably lucky that uh, our match that, that I won in 1985 happened at the time when Gorbachev took over, and it was the beginning of Perestroika. And I spent a little bit of time in the book explaining you know, uh, the, uh, these events. Um, though, of course, I concentrated more on, 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 on post-Cold War um, uh, development. Um, but I did a few things you know, at that time already to demonstrate my, um, my, dis uh, my disobedience. Uh, I had um, a big interview uh, in Germany with the Der Spiegel magazine, the most prominent German magazine in 1985, 30 years ago, um, where I complained about um, Soviet chess mafia, about you know, uh, uh, the way they ruled the game of chess and about uh, their connections to defeat the president, Campomanes. So I recently I read the interview and it was so pathetic. I just read it and just it's, there was nothing there. But at that time it was, it was a coup. I was the first Soviet athlete if you may call us athletes, yes. <laughs> yes. In this case, I'll be probably the most decorated Soviet and Russian athlete in history. Uh, um, um, and uh, um, um, it's, it's, you know, uh, to protest publicly uh, for the Western publication uh, without any permission from the state authorities, that was punishable. But again, I was lucky, it was 1985, and the decision was, let them play, let's see who is going to win. And at least I had my chance. I grabbed my chance, I won the title, and I went on by playing more matches with Karpov. And at the same time, recognizing that as the world champion, as somebody who was so well known, even at age 22, 30 years ago. So then I won the next match in, in 86 and then in 87. And the country has been gradually changing. And I thought that my engagement in this battle uh, uh, for democracy. At that time, we just we thought about just, you know, an improvement of the system. So it was, was vital to encourage people to join, encourage other people to follow. And um, I did things, you know, steadily. I, I steadily, you know, expanded the, 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 the territory of protest. Uh, uh, in 1989, I had a big interview with the Playboy magazine. That definitely was not well received by Soviet authorities. <laughs> yes. It was a big interview where I talked about freedom and other things that I have to confess that I had little ideas about, you know, the, 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 the institutions of democracy, how they work. But I mean, I tried to express my, you know, 
uh, disillusionment with the Soviet system and, uh, and, and, and explaining why I, at that time I already believed that the free market and liberal democracy was far, far superior to um, the Soviet system. Uh, but the biggest uh, challenge uh, I, I mm, uh, issued was in 1990 when I played my, my last, uh, the fifth match was Anatoly Karpov. The first half of this match was in New York, New York City, and I ref refused to play under the Soviet flag, which was quite a challenge because it was just September 1990, and uh, I, you know, I said, no Soviet flag, I want Russian flag next to me. Um, <laughs> it was quite uh, amusing because when I showed up in the, C I think it was CBS this morning studio, uh, with the handmade Russian flag that my mother just, you know, constructed hastily uh, last night, you know, having a sticker and a few ribbons, you know, cutting them and making sure that we're not, you know, making mistake by placing this or the, in the right order. They looked at me and said, what is that? I said, it's a Russian flag. But nobody, you know, nobody knew how the Russian flag looked at that time. It was just a, was quite a sensation. And uh, for four games, I could, you know, I, I, I had my Russian flag next to me. Karpov played on the Soviet flag. The Soviet delegation, Karpov's delegation, has been issuing protest after protest after protest. If, uh, and eventually, the uh, organizers, under pressure from FIDE, International Chess Federation, decided to remove Russian flag, but also the Soviet flag. So we played with no flags. So when I <laughs> thought I, I won this, this, this battle. <laughs> and uh, while, you know, I just, you know, it's my political views became more active and more known, so uh, uh, many paid attention because I was not just a rising chess star, but also I, 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 I was fairly active and I tried not just to say a few words, but uh, to come up with you know, very uh, detailed criticism of the Soviet system and also with the Western policies that I believed at that time were inadequate in treating uh, uh, Gorbachev and his uh, um, meager attempts to uh, change the regime uh, because Gorbachev kept saying, that he wanted to build a socialism with a human face. My reaction was, Frankenstein also had human face. <laughs> uh, and um, in March 1990, yeah, while I, just, I was in the United States after my first meeting with the editorial board of the Wall Street Journal, um, someone organized a meeting for me in the White House and I met uh, General Scowcroft, the head of the National Security Council, and he um, was accompanied at this meeting by the rising political star, a great expert on Soviet affairs, the head of the Soviet desk at that time, Condoleezza Rice. And um, I think it's, this was quite a strange meeting because both sides were quite disappointed. They were disappointed because they heard from me something that definitely didn't work for their grand strategy. They asked me about Gorbachev, and I said Gorbachev was going down. And, um, it's, it's just a matter of time. Soviet Union probably would, would be gone fairly soon because Gorbachev has, has no plan and, and, and what all he has been trying to do would eventually fail. They didn't like my answer. Next question, what about Yeltsin? That March 1990, so uh, in two months Yeltsin will be elected um, the chairman of Supreme Soviet of, uh, of Russian Federation Parliament. Uh, they looked at me and said, Yeltsin? He's a drunk and he's a loose cannon. I also looked at them and said, wait a second, are you asking me about his character or about his political future? <laughs> so, I think I made no impression. Uh, but, but, you know, for me it was also quite a shocking experience because I could see through Soviet propaganda and I just didn't buy these stories because I've been traveling since I was a kid, first time in, in France in 1976, and I had you know, good education at home. Uh, so my uncle and his friends, so they just, you know, they supplied me with books and I, you know, I was a critical mind, I could see it through. But I also live uh, under the impression about, you know, the all-powerful United States intelligence, CIA, Pentagon, so this. And listening to, to General Scowcroft, I just couldn't believe my ears. I mean, we all knew in Russia that, you know, Yeltsin would be the chairman of whatever, Supreme Soviet of uh, Russian Federation Parliament. And they didn't believe me. So how come? How come they could make these mistakes? I mean, this is something in, just in, 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 this, in this global picture that I had in my mind, you know, it's just, just fall apart. 
Um, but it's, it, it, it's from bad it went even to, 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 to worse. Uh, in November 1991, 1991, I was in DC receiving one of uh, hum, uh, uh, human rights awards, and at the same day, to my horror, you know, I could see that newly appointed, or you may say reappointed, uh, Minister of the Foreign Affairs of the USSR, Edward Shevardnadze, he was received pompously by Bush 41 administration. The president himself, the Secretary of State, Jim Baker III, and you know, all these authorities, and they have been celebrating a new dawn in the Soviet-American relations, five weeks before the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> Just, it's, it's, you know, I thought it was insane. It's, uh, how could they make this mistake? And, um, and the book is very much you know, an attempt to actually analyze these mistakes, but also following mistakes. Because um, uh, what happened after 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, important to remember, to a big surprise of Bush administration, and actually to, to Europeans, because nobody expected things to happen so fast, uh, from collapse of the Berlin Wall to the collapse of the Soviet Union, just 25 months. So just so quick. There were 25 years with nothing happening, and suddenly, in 25 months, evil empire had, had disappeared. And sometimes winning the game, you know, also, you know, um, creates a problem. It's, I, I learned it from chess, because it's a, it's a no normal human reaction. It's not just complacency. You want to rest on your laurels. It's, I call it the gravity of past success. The, the game is over. We won. Let's celebrate. And there were many opportunities missed um, uh, uh, in the early 90s. But I can hardly blame you know, Clinton's administration because they got a mandate. So they won the elections because Americans wanted to forget about you know, Cold War, about all the problems. Victory. So why not to celebrate, get rich, you know, do whatever we want, but not to be engaged in any world affairs. Many things, I believe, could have happened if the grand strategy would be designed in early 90s. Why it's important? Because at the end of any historical period, you have to come up with a plan. And the leadership means that you present this plan and you move on. It was not there. And it's what's happened with US foreign policy, which was fairly consistent during the uh, uh, Cold War. It, there were differences, but within the range. From 91 to these days, it's like a pendulum swinging from one side to another. You know, Bill Clinton did very little. George W. did too much. <laughs> Obama has been doing nothing. And it just it move, it, move, it, 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 it slides from one side, one extreme to another, which, by the way, creates a huge problem with U.S. credibility in the world. How can you trust the country? still the leader of the free world, still the most powerful economy, the most powerful military, uh, while, you know, every change in administration could, change to dramatic, uh, could, could lead to a dramatic change uh, in, 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 in its foreign policy. What about loyalty to the allies, long-standing allies, like the states of Israel, for instance? What about uh, fight for ideals, fight for, uh, um, uh, for um, so the global stability? Because when I hear comments actually from both sides of political spectrum during this presidential campaign that this is not our business, we could forget about it, we are protected by the two oceans, come on, it's this. The most globalized economy on the planet cannot afford to ignore global stability. Yes, Syria is far away. So was Japan in 1941. And it took how many months for the entire Japanese fleet to get ready and uh, to uh, attack Pearl Harbor. That took 2,100 American lives. Al-Qaeda training base in Afghanistan in 2001, they're also far away. This time, at that time, it took only 19 terrorists crossing the Atlantic uh, and uh, killing actually more than 3,000 Americans in one day. Today, they don't even have to cross the Atlantic. Probably, and God forbid, they can inflict damage to electric grid, you know, by sitting in a cellar somewhere. So these threats today are global. Because people tend to forget that, yes, we invented so many great things. We, I mean, the free world. And we use them. 
use these technologies, devices, to promote positive agenda, agenda of peace, agenda of cultural and social change, agenda of business. Everything is global today. Business, trade, uh, social uh, networks, the world is getting smaller. But the problem is this device that you, everybody probably has in his or her pocket is agnostic. You can use it for good stuff, and you could use it for bad things. And we have to say that terrorists, they know how to use it. They're quite skillful by using our devices, devices invited by us, against the very foundation of the society which helped to create them. When I play chess, I, you know, I was an aggressive player. Uh, and uh, in, one, in my previous book, How Life Imitates Chess, I even argued for attacker's advantage, one of the chapters of the book called Attacker's Advantage. But today, I think it goes without saying, being on a defense, it's just it's to concede the game. You cannot defend against many threats because these threats cannot be even identified unless you go after, after the source. It's not about being you know, a Republican or a Democrat because the bad guys go after Americans. When they try to blow up the plane, they don't care who's flying in. And uh, this is something that, you know, it's yet to be understood by, I, I don't expect the current administration will understand it, but I do expect that during these debates, the uh, GOP debates, Democratic debates, but eventually debate for, the debates for general elections, will this country will come back to, um, to, a, to a bipartisan foreign policy that will present an adequate response to the problems we have been facing. And these problems will not go away. It's not about a nightmare that disappears with the sunlight when you open your eyes in the morning. It will stay. Because when you look at Vladimir Putin's Russia, Iranian mullahs, uh, North Korean dictators, family dictatorship, stateless terrorists, whoever is challenging the free world, uh, they all, always look at America as a number one target. Why? Because they have no other foundation to stay in power. What does Vladimir Putin, what can Vladimir Putin offer to Russian public today? Economy is in terrible shape. No, he enjoyed dramatically, he enjoyed the dramatic rise in oil prices and consequently the rise in the living standards in, 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 in Russia uh, 10 years ago. But now he knows, and probably everybody in the country who still can you know, think, that economy will never offer him another excuse for staying in power for life. So Russian propaganda today, it's a 24-7 machine that is aimed at the free world with America at, at the top. Anything that happens, it definitely has America behind it. As you know, the latest story, the doping scandal. State supported doping scandal. Of course, America you know, investigated it and pushed the uh, uh, um, International uh, Doping Committee to uh, punish Russians. Anything. So. Um, Russian air jetliner attacked by terrorists. The news on Russian, on Russian TV, 90% probability, terrorist attack, a bomb, and now, responding to the words of the Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, Russian uh, anchorman said, it, it basically blamed Americans for predicting this since America you know, warned Russians that war in the Middle East you know, could have consequences. And the message was, it's very important to understand, message to Russian people, that they attacked Russian, not American plane. Think why. And that's the one of the, one of the millions of examples of, of anti-American, anti-Western, of course, anti-Semitic propaganda, because that's, Jews are always there, so just uh, to be attacked by all the dictators. Um, and uh, uh, so far, you know, what we see is just, you know, it's, the, it's a very weak, timid response from the free world. And uh, uh, just to wrap off, you know, this is a story about Vladimir Putin, though unfortunately it will not end up tonight, no matter what I say. <laughs> it's, um, it's very far from being wrapped off in history. Um, uh, it's dictators know that they have to demonstrate strengths. The only thing they cannot afford is to uh, show weakness. The moment dictator looks weak, he can expect that 
his own inner circle may stab him in the back. Um, Putin knows this, that his only, the only way to uh, control the country is to create a virtual reality where he, Vladimir Putin, looks like you know, an invincible leader, the most powerful uh, uh, politician in, on the planet, uh, someone who can defy any other power, including the United States. And one of the best demonstrations of um, this um, um, uh, of this technique used by Russian propaganda machine was Putin's recent trip to the, to, to the United Nations, to New York City, uh, just um, six weeks ago. Um, yeah, even five weeks ago. <laughs> no, six weeks ago. Um, uh, at the end of September. Um, people expected Putin to say something from, the, from this platform. My expectations were very low. When the Wall Street Journal asked me to write an article, I said I could do it in advance. <laughs> because I thought that it was foolish to expect Putin to say something significant because it was not, it was not his intention. And uh, I knew that no, ma no matter what Putin would say, he would act anyway. Unfortunately, I knew that no matter what Obama would say, will not change his behavior. He will not act. So uh, Putin also knew it. And uh, he showed up in New York. He delivered his speech. And then he had a meeting with Obama. Again, it was not about negotiations, because they had nothing to discuss. It was all about one picture. You remember this picture, Putin reluctantly shaking Obama's hand? I bet you he spent hours in front of the mirror practicing this. <laughs> It's very serious, because we know that the picture is worth a thousand words. Putin had both the picture and a thousand words. For propaganda machine to demonstrate that Vladimir Putin had no choice. He had to go to New York, to the belly of the beast, to meet Obama, shake his hand. But the next day, Russian planes bombed in Syria American-backed uh, uh, um, uh, opposition. That's the message. It's, and I, when I hear President Obama talking about leadership, and that this Putin is not a strong leader and it's a failed policy, that there are very different scales of coordinates. You know, this is, you have to understand that Putin is playing a different game because it's a game of survival. He doesn't care what happens in five years, and he doesn't care what happens with Russia. It's all about him staying in power for life. Russia today is a full-blown one-man dictatorship. And uh, Putin knows the rules of the game. Unfortunately, his opponents, they demonstrate very little knowledge or even, even less political will to confront him. He's expecting something from Europe while America keeps leading from behind. It's probably a bit too optimistic. Europe is weak, is divided. Thanks to Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, uh, who I call now the only politician was balls in Europe. <laughs> that some kind of sanctions are still in place. Though, of course, uh, Angela Merkel is, is under regular attacks from uh, social democrats who control the foreign ministries, the coalition government in Germany, and of course, German business that is dreaming about restoring this um, very profitable relationship with, with uh, corrupt Putin's, uh, Putin's Russia. Um, and uh, uh, when I hear time and again that Vladimir Putin is too dangerous, Vladimir Putin is, you know, confronting him today, it just could lead to a big war. So probably we should make another concession. Probably we should you know, find a way, as I, as I say, to find common ground. So, and uh, my response is, is he more dangerous than Joseph Stalin in 1948? Seriously? Are you kidding me? Vladimir Putin and Joseph Stalin? When Stalin wanted to take over West Berlin, the United States was not hesitant, probably was hesitant, but eventually one man decided that 
you know, you'd better have this, uh, this conflict now than to wait before it's too late. Um, and uh, during my book tour and my speeches and interviews, people, you know, keep asking me about the, the current debates and about my uh, preferences. Who, is, who of all these candidates could be the best, you know, uh, uh, next president of the United States from my perspectives? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a voter, so I'm not the U.S. citizen, just have a green card. But I have my opinion and that's just listening to all of them, you know, I, I think that if following, following the idea that it's, it's about policies, it's what I want to see uh, uh, um, as the new foreign policy of the United States, I believe that, I don't know, from what I heard, that Marco Rubio fits this, 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 this description better than others. But today I, I had a few hours of free time, it doesn't happen often in the tour, and of course I um, used it very productively. I went to the Harry Truman's library. And um, now when people, people uh, ask me again f for whom I'm, you know, who is my, uh, who is my favorite candidate, I will tell them that. <laughs> and uh, this is not a story, you know, designed here for Kansas City for his auditorium just to honor this great man. It's, that's what I've been saying for a long time. And uh, I believe that it's, it, the, the role Harry Truman played in, in the victory of the, in the Cold War, it's, it's vastly underestimated. Because it's few understand that the difference between dictatorships and democracies is in the, is in the power of democracies to build lasting institutions. It's like a long strategic game. Dictators are very good in playing sharp games, sacrificing something, creating problems here and there, chaos. They're much better off in the chaotic situations because they can react quickly. But they cannot come up with a long-term planning because, again, it's all about survival. Democracies must have a plan. And it's just amazing to think of how many institutions, fundamental institutions, that brought the, the ultimate victory in the Cold War were built under uh, Harry Truman's uh, uh, patronage under his watch. Uh, NATO, CIA, the reform of the Voice of America, National Security Council, and I can still, I can keep counting. But what's most important is a political will. And, and, and it's, it's a clear vision, you know, of the world, you know, of just good and evil, and understanding the U.S. role. That you know, the United States was the only garden at that time, of the world against Soviet, uh, Soviet expansionism. And uh, uh, you know, taking risky decisions, but saving, as we know today, hundreds of millions of people from communism slavery. And um, I can tell you, I recently, I uh, visited uh, South Korea. I was there as a chairman of Human Rights Foundation. We have been uh, advocating for a long time for the um, uh, North Korean Human Rights Act to uh, pass in the South Korean Parliament, which is quite difficult to, to could be to, to the surprise of many because of the heavy lobbying from the uh, uh, supporters of the North, even in South Korea. And uh, we also have been helping uh, North Korean defectors to send balloons across the border. It's a, it's a very low tech uh, 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 experience. It's just the balloons, you know, with, uh, uh, with a little lock uh, they, they filled with hydrogen and a little lock uh, with acid and uh, it goes across the DMZ demilitarized zone and then it's at one point it blows up, you know, when the, the acid, you know, just destroys the lock. And it's this, all this, you know, thousands of leaflets, you know, in a very cheap plastic, they just, they're spreading around in, in a few square miles. And uh, I, you know, personally helped to push one balloons and it was near the DMZ. And standing there, you can understand the difference between the free world and uh, Gulag, the communist uh, uh, dic dictatorship. It it's was, of course, in the evening, I mean, late, late evening, almost midnight, and you could see on one side South Korea, a thriving democracy, market economy, with nearly 50 million people saved by the great sacrifice of American lives and by great leadership of Harry Truman from communism. And it's all, all in lights. And on the opposite side, you can see darkness. There's nothing else but darkness. 
It's all dark, as if it's somebody just created this image to demonstrate the difference between light and darkness. And there are many, by the way, just for someone who, can, you know, who is, is interested, just you can look in the internet and see the pictures from the satellites. They see this of light on, on, in the south and darkness, um, darkness uh, in the north. And I, uh, I thought that it would be appropriate, actually, to read few words from Harry Truman himself, uh, because while working on my CNN editorial this week, I uh, discovered, you know, um, I discovered um, one of his uh, speeches. It's in February, February the 3rd, 1951, the speech dedicated to, uh, dedicated to the chapel of the four chaplains in Philadelphia. And he spoke very passionately about the responsibility of the U.S. and why it mattered. So he said, the job we face is a hard one. Perhaps it will be harder in a few years immediately ahead than it will be in the years thereafter. If we can get over the present crisis successfully, if we can restrain aggression before it bursts into another world war, then things will be easier in the future. The sacrifices that are being made today by the men and women of this country are not being made in vain. Our men are in Korea because we're trying to prevent a worldwide war. I told you, I saw the results of, 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 this, of this sacrifice. And Truman continued, leadership carries with it heavy responsibilities. Good leaders do not threaten to quit if things go wrong. They expect cooperation, of course, and they expect everyone to do his share, but they do not stop to measure sacrifices with a teaspoon while the fight is on. But his next line stopped me cold when I read it. Truman continued, we cannot lead the forces of freedom from behind. 1951. It's, it's, like a, it's like a lost letter to the Obama administration. You know, uh, it's, 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 if you want to understand who, who is losing, who is winning, you know, it's, you could simply lose at, at the statements made by Putin and Obama. Four years ago, Obama said, Assad must go. Putin said, mm, no. So who's winning? So uh, Putin is sending military jets and his experts to Syria. Iran has been sending troops and ammunition. Obama sends John Kerry. No wonder who's calling the shots there. And uh, there's this a lot I, 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 I would like to add because it's, it's quite an emotional moment. Uh, and I, I'm very happy that today I could uh, visit Truman's library and, uh, and uh, read. I, I knew about it, but just still being there, you know, touching this history, recognizing, you know, that's this, this is a great contribution to, uh, to um, the fight against communism and, and dictators in the world. It was, it was quite, quite amazing. Um, and, uh, uh, just a last comment about the um, bipartisanship, because some people, you know, they, they, they think that today it's, you know, it's, it's, there's no room for bipartisan cooperation. And I do understand there's so many differences inside the country, domestic issues, where, you know, you probably agreement cannot be reached. And of course, this, the current president was probably the most divisive one in the history of this country. Uh, but still, the foreign policy is something that should bring Americans together. And uh, I, um, Recently watched, uh, again, the debates, the televised deba first televised debates between Nixon and Kennedy in 1960. And uh, a, a part of the fact that I was quite amazed by um, the civility and the mutual respect of, of two uh, future presidents of this country, it was very important that they, they disagreed on means, not on goals. You know, you could see two Americans arguing about the future of this great country, uh, having different ideas, uh, though it's for many uh, modern scholars, it could be quite surprising to find out that uh, Kennedy was even more hawkish in foreign policy than, 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 than Richard Nixon. But it's very important that we'll see this, you know, this debate to, to become bipartisan and uh, to create something that will help to restore the credibility and the image of the United States in the world. And uh, you know, with, with a simple rec rec recognition of the fact the world is small and is getting smaller. And uh, trying to 
uh, evade these responsibilities today could, only, could, could bring a much bigger disaster tomorrow. Of course, the price of confronting Putin, Iranian, Iranian ayatollahs, or any other thugs and dictators in the world is, 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 is quite high. And I'm not telling you it's an easy task. But what we know from history, when we go back to the 30s, or we go back to the 40s, we know that tomorrow price, price only goes up. And the day after tomorrow, the price could be unbearable. It's very simple. That's what Harry Truman knew, and that's the, that's the lesson that uh, uh, modern leaders, new leaders, should learn from uh, um, him, from Harry Truman, and from other presidents who helped uh, America to uh, 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 fight and win in the Cold War. And the uh, final remark is, um, I have here my son Vadim, who's 19, who lives in Moscow, uh, to travel uh, um, across the country just to learn more about the United States. Uh, in 2005, when I left professional chess and started uh, 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 what many people mistakenly call political activities in Russia, because it was not exactly politics, since you know, here in, in uh, um, America, the moment you say politics, you think about campaign, debates, fundraising. Putin never participated in a single debate in his life. Just to understand, this is it's debates is something that uh, could happen in Russia only between demonstrators and riot police. Um, and uh, um, and when people ask me whether you know whether chess, my chess skills, my chess knowledge could help me in in uh, uh, promoting our agenda in Russia, my answer was negative. I said no, because in chess we have fixed rules and unpredictable results. In Putin's Russia, it's exactly the opposite. You know, rules, rules keep changing, results not. Uh, and uh, um, when people ask me about my motivations, I said I would like to see my son to grow uh, um, and to become an adult in a free country. It didn't happen yet. Um, but I, I'm still optimistic. And uh, when we when we arrived today in, in, in Kansas City and we were driving from the airport to the hotel, so we saw a few pictures, so just because we, I told him about this, the, the, the triumph of the royals and uh, about big celebration, and we looked at the picture on the internet with nearly one million people getting together in downtown. And uh, he looked at this picture and uh, he said something that made me feel proud and, uh, and, and hopeful. He said, oh, one day, this kind of crowd should gather in Moscow in the Red Square. And um, I know that if it happens, that will, be the, that will mark the end of Putin's dictatorship. But again, I remain cautiously optimistic because I know history is on our side. And uh, it's not about uh, Vladimir Putin's fate. He will end up as poorly and miserably as all dictators. The uh, only question is what price we in Russia and uh, people elsewhere and this country will pay to end uh, the rule of this paranoid dictator who, as we understand, among many other tools, controls also nukes. But um, c delaying confrontation, making concessions, pretending that you can find some kind of common ground, it's a bad mistake that was made in the past. And uh, I, the book that, uh, that I'm, uh, I'm presenting here today tells you that we should learn from history, from our mistakes made in the past, to make sure that our future strategy will be more adequate. Thank you. And, uh, so, are you... Um, okay, go ahead. Oh, lady. No, it's, it's, yeah, but it's a longer line. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kasparov, for being here in Kansas City and speaking with us today. 
Uh, I just wanted to say you, you touched on a lot of different points tonight, uh, particularly uh, with foreign policy. You know, I'm curious with the United States uh, failing to find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, as well as uh, finding a clear mission in Afghanistan, um, and spending trillions of dollars on our military as it is, and we have trillions in debt as it is, how can the United States offer a foreign policy position that would further endanger us in going into more debt and potentially ruining our credibility in the, in the world if we cannot commit to a truth, uh, which would be uh, you know, following our actions, following our orders. I'm curious uh, you know, what your opinion is for making this foreign policy situation better given the United States uh, you know, troubles as it is right now. Uh, yeah, we agree on one thing, that U.S. is in trouble now as, the, as a free world. Now, um, the situation is dangerous. Uh, by the way, if we look back on 2008, I didn't see hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing to Europe. Uh, Iraq was not very stable, but pacified. There were no massacres in Syria. So the things didn't look maybe very good, but at least, you know, there were, there were hopes for improvement. The security situation in the last seven years has deteriorated dramatically. And um, I can spend a lot of time talking about Iraq invasion, and I, I'm not arguing about, you know, WMD's uh, failure, and, uh, and you can find many arguments against this decision, and I would agree with all of them, except one. I was born and raised in a communist country, and I cannot afford psychologically, as millions of my compatriots or millions of people who had similar background, to complain about any action that led to the destruction of a dictatorship. Saddam Hussein was a butcher. And while American invasion of Iraq maybe just didn't create, you know, a great stable democratic Iraq, but it offered people there a chance. It was not a solution, it was a chance. They, whether they grabbed it or not, that's another story. Maybe Iraq was doomed because it had Shia, Sunni, Kurds, maybe all these maps of the, of the uh, Middle East that have been designed after World War I, uh, by the way, by just, you know, by powers that, you know, probably you know, had good intentions, but they just you know, they didn't understand the complexity of, of the region. Maybe these, these, these borders cannot sustain this pressure from ethnic and religious you know, groups fighting each other. But uh, it's, it's a problem is that it says, if you made a mistake, like in, in the game of chess, you play the game, you made a mistake, it was a wrong plan, but six moves later, it would be much bigger mistake to say, wow, I made a mistake, let's go back. And let's, you know, start from the scratch, because many moves made, it's a new position. So the problem is that, you know, uh, by 2009, 2010, there was a new position on the geopolitical chessboard. And this new position, you know, uh, was crying for having a plan, not the uh, uh, infamous reset button that Hillary Clinton pushed, trying to find common ground with Putin's Russia, after Putin's Russia invaded the tiny Republic of Georgia, by the way. Um, and uh, lacking a plan uh, helped, the way I see it, helped uh, uh, Iranians uh, and, uh, and others uh, in the region, you know, just to, um, to solidify the sort of their, their, their powers and, you know, to um, create a new, much more dangerous challenge uh, to the stability in the region. Um, you can walk away. The problem is, if America walks away, it creates a vacuum. And the vacuum is being filled. And as I said, you know, you are not safe here. Uh, I mean, yesterday, I'm not a big fan of Ted Cruz, just, you know, just to prevent your questions, but I think he had one a good line in the, yesterday's debates. You know, he said, it's, you think that defending this country is too expensive? Try not to. Well. So, tr yes. See. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I have a question. I'm just wondering, what was your turning point when you realized that Soviet system was wrong, was corrupt? And the other question, I wonder if, uh, if you think in our lifetime we would see any meaningful change in Russia? Um, I mean, like Putin might be gone, but uh, you know, I'm not sure if it wouldn't yeah, be the I, same I, kind I, of Yeah, I, I wonder, I mean, person. do we have to argue about uh, Soviet, Soviet uh, regime being corrupt, uh, uh, totalitarian? They just, do we disagree on that? Or you're looking for my arguments, or we have different views? Oh, 
I just. My, my question was, what was your turning point? I mean, what if uh, no, there's no talking? It's, it's any 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 dictatorship, you know, is unhuman. And I, I. Uh, no, but you were raised in a communist country. And yes, we, I was. We know how the schools. So were there so, at the time, so Andrei so Sakharov, so Boris Nemtsov, so Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Yes. So but, there were many people raised in a communist country, and they could see. So Vladimir Bukovsky. Should I continue the line? No, no, no. No, no, no. that's this. Yeah, and I yes, and I realized, you know, the the shortcomings of the regime. And I believe, you know, that millions and millions of Soviet citizens by 1990, 1991, they saw that the regime was not just ineffective, it just, it's, uh, it was already dead, you know, it was empty shell. So that's why the transition happened very quickly. The problem is that it didn't bring the change that many expected, but one of the problems that after 75 years of communism, uh, people had very little idea about democracy, how it worked, because, you know, uh, balance of power, you know, all the institutions, you know, the independent uh, uh, judiciary, those were, nobody could see it. All people could see it, democracy equals prosperity. As I said, you know, many of them simply confused ballot box with ATM. Um, and, uh, uh, and then with, when it didn't happen, and they voted many times, and the results were not very um, satisfactory, so uh, there was a disappointment. And here Putin comes, uh, and suddenly oil prices are going up, and people could see that, wow, we have a new leader, life is getting better, maybe it's democracy. So it's a very simple, of course, you know, explanation. And uh, following your, your question is, yes, of course I will see it during my lifetime, because I'm going to uh, live a few more years. Uh, and uh, I don't think Vladimir Putin will live that long. So it's the, and uh, um, I can, um, you know, I'm not happy to hear stories that you know, something is wrong with Russia, with Russian people. Back to North Korea, South Korea. You have same people. Same people, you know, started from the, from the scratch, both nations. One was under communism, one was, you know, uh, was a temporary under American occupation, eventually turned to be a very, very successful country. It's not about people, it's about, it's about conditions. And I believe that, you know, um, Russia will have no choice if we want Russia to survive. And I think it's, 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 it's paramount for the global security and stability uh, as to uh, become um, a democratic country joining family of civilized nations. Since we're in the presidential debate season, uh, if you could for a moment pretend you're on the uh, debate stage. And the question that I would ask you is, uh, if you were going to be president of the United States, what would be the top I cannot three? be by definition. I was not born in this country. <laughs> Let's pretend, though, for a moment. Okay. What would be the top policy moves that you would make as president to deal with this dangerous situation that you've described this evening? And uh, thank you again for coming. Um, I mean, thanks for, you know, uh, entrusting me in the future of this country, <laughs> <laughs> even, even for a few moments. Uh, I, you know, um, then it's, it, it, it would be a long story because it's not that I thought about it, but I just I could start offering certain certain moves as I believe right moves to improve the situation on the board. But um, what I believe is, is is paramount is is to restore the credibility, because you don't want to use force all the time. I don't think this is this is uh, uh, a sign of you know a strong leader. The, the sign the, the 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 best sign of leadership is credibility while you're making threats. Ronald Reagan didn't use much of force, but he made credible threats. Uh, and uh, um, I think that now um, the America and US president is no longer seen as somebody who can make credible threats. That's you know, somebody who has a plan and, and, and uh, someone that they can rely on. It's very important to restore this trust. And uh, um, I think it's, it's, it's doable. By, by demonstrating you know, how America is going to uh, um, oppose actions, I would point at Vladimir Putin, probably because you know, it's, I know it's, it's, it's better, but also because America is, is, a, is the leader, and the leader should look for the source. And of course Putin is, I call it in the, in the book, boss of the bosses, the capo de tutti capi. You go after Putin, you create problems for Putin, 
And that will definitely be the right message to Iranians, to North Koreans, and to whoever is trying to um, challenge U.S. interests. And of course, you know, you have to start building coalitions. And there are many things that you could do. Um, it's, it's not as, the moment is not as, as, as mm, uh, convenient as in 91. But still, let's not forget, America is by far the most powerful economy, most powerful uh, uh, military, and um, if American president shows determination to follow, uh, to follow the lines that, to follow the strategies that worked so uh, um, well in the past, in, during the Cold War, I think many people will follow. Many people will, will realize that, you know, it's time to actually get together and, uh, and uh, to start uh, moving human race, you know, us, all of us, uh, uh, forward. Good evening, and uh, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, I have a comment and a question. First of all, so happy anniversary. Yeah. I think it's been exactly 30 years. Yes, and two, a couple two, of days. Two, two days ago, yes. Yeah, two days ago. Years. I won the title. Yeah, yeah the, thank yeah. you. Happy anniversary. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I can remember being a young student in Moscow watching the match, and we were watching it as closely as probably Kansas City is watching Royals, because to us, my family and friends, you were representing democracy and the victory of democracy over the Soviet, Soviet Union. So we were actually glued to the TV. Thank you. Uh, several years ago, you visited Kansas City. And five years ago. Five years ago, you, that was exactly. right from the stage you were talking about the political future of Russia, and to a lot of people, me inclusive, um, it was a bit surprising, but now I can tell you, so very far into the future, well, at least five years, and now that we have Boris Nemtsov assassinated, which is a huge loss to everyone, you personally, me personally, um, Russia occupying Crimea, wars, um, TV that is impossible to watch because it's just propaganda and so on. And yet, 90% supposedly supporting uh, Vladimir Putin. How do you see a um, political, even physical end of Vladimir Putin? Will, what are the odds he will actually either die from natural causes or he will be tried in Gog finally in the court of law, or potentially can be replaced with some kind of, a, as a result of some type of uh, inter-Kremlin political games. Because um, I, I personally don't see him retiring in peace just no, like Boris Yeltsin. It's, it's, yeah, it's impossible. Okay. That's, that's, that's uh, non-science fiction. Vladimir Putin retiring. Yes. Uh, what do you think he'll die on the job for um, natural causes? Uh, I think it's, it's when we look at Putin's dictatorship and we look at other dictators uh, even recently, you know, it's important to understand that the success of the dictator who stays in power for so long, it's based on his ability to eliminate any potential opposition. Any democratic opposition first, and then eventually anybody who could challenge him from within. When people ask me this question, say, who can challenge Vladimir Putin from inside Russia? My answer is, if I knew the name of this man, he would be dead already. <laughs> That's why Putin is, is, is still there, because he can, he can smell this, 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 the, 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 the danger. Um, but no matter how good and smart and savvy is the dictator, I mean, when I say good, you know, good in, in, in anticipating these potential threats, um, he eventually makes a mistake because you can't live under this pressure all the time. And uh, what is vital is to create situation where this mistake is inevitable, to start destroying his image of you know, all-powerful, invincible ruler. And a lot can be done by the United States by just imposing real sanctions, going after his buddies, after these billionaires, oligarchs, state-owned companies, and you know, uh, hurting you know, uh, Russia's interest uh, uh, around the world. America alone, without European allies, could do enough to uh, diminish Putin in the eyes of his inner circle of Russian elite. There's no way he will walk away from Kremlin on his own. Uh, he's going to die in Kremlin. Now, whether it will happen from the biological cause, a natural biological cause, because every death is biological cause. <laughs> uh, 
uh, to uh, or from outside intervention that will cause the biological death. So uh, I don't know. I can only speculate that it's all dictators recently they ended up very poorly. And I think that's one of the reasons of Russia, Russian troops fighting in Syria now is Putin's image of Assad, you know, being destroyed. And that could be like Gaddafi. So I think it's some kind of a dictator's brotherhood. And uh, Assad's disaster could lead to, so to some kind of, you know, uh, uh, domino effect in Russia. So if Assad goes down today, if you want a practical, you know, so advice, if the um, United States, the free world, could help uh, Syrian opposition to bring down Assad, that would be a terrible blow to Vladimir Putin. It's psychologically, because it's all about psychology. Something will happen inside Russia. It will be an inside job. You're right. And um, again, don't expect democracy next day. That's very important. And it's not, again, because you know, in Russia, we're not ready for that. Simply after many years of dictatorship, political climate changes. Because dictator, you know, in power, he has been creating the political desert. He has been just eliminating any, any sign of life around him. And the longer he stays in power, dry the desert is. And who can survive in a dry desert? Snakes, scorpions, rats. <laughs> so that's why Russia will move into a very turbulent period. And this transition may end even with the collapse of the country that is under heavy pressure from China in the Far East and radical Islam in the South. But while you know, this picture doesn't look rosy, the problem is that every day he stays in power, every month, every year, makes, it, makes the outcome even worse. It's not about choosing between good or bad. It's simply you know, trying, to, um, choose for, trying to go for lesser evil. Uh, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, I did have a question. You said that in Russia today, in the media, state-controlled media, America's sort of the boogeyman, the Ooh. group that's blamed. Trust me. Yeah, I believe that. Um, so how do we sort of balance um, a more active foreign policy with trying not to sort of be the self-fulfilling boogeyman that's um, at least being portrayed it's, that way? But it's, it's, it, it doesn't matter what you do. It's, it's still target number one. So that's why stop worrying about uh, a dictator's propaganda machine. <laughs> it's, you know, you should understand his true intentions. And probably the best way to, uh, to analyze someone's intentions is to look at the budget. You can look at the budget of the family, at the budget of the corporation, or at the budget of the state. Vladimir Putin's Russia has been experiencing problems, financial problems now. Oil price is down. Economy is, is not in a good shape. So first time in, 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 in his uh, life as a ruler of Russia in more than 15 years, he doesn't have enough cash to throw it you know, here and there. So he had to make cuts. What did he cut? Social security, health care, education, culture. What did he, uh, what he didn't cut? Actually, he keeps adding money to three areas. Military, security apparatus, propaganda. It's a war budget. So it doesn't matter what you do. It just, it will, he will keep throwing money in, in, in painting America as the, as, the, as the evil of the, in the world. Russia today is, a, I guess, is the most, it's, it's the best funded television network in the planet. So just the official budget for the whole propaganda uh, um, uh, machine official budget, because in Russia we do understand that many things you, you, you see on the budget, it could be just the tip of the iceberg. But official is something like $1.3 billion. It just was spent on propaganda machine. And lion's share of that goes to the foreign propaganda because he understands you know, how to work out with different lobbying groups, especially in Europe. But even in this country, you know, it's, a, it's, con it's kind of a bipartisan support for an idea of restoring friendly relations with Putin's Russia. Thank you, sir. I say the name of Edward Snowden and let you take it where you want to go with what he did or what is going to happen to him. <coughs> I have no idea what's going to happen with Edward Snowden. I, uh, um, I don't want to spend a lot of time here discussing this issue of, you know, 
security and privacy. Uh, all I know is a simple fact, he stole American secrets and he ended up in Moscow. Those are the facts. So, uh, it's... Um, a few years ago, Mikhail Khodorkovsky was, uh, was released, and since then he's been a vocal part of the opposition. Do you think that the United States should be reluctant to cultivate relationships with oligarchs or former oligarchs? Um, Mikhail Khodorkovsky spent 10 years in Putin's prison, and I think that's uh, whatever he did before, you know, that definitely exonerated him from all the, all the wrongdoings. And uh, he has been steadily supporting change in Russia, um, even being in prison, you know, um, he wrote many articles and uh, his uh, funds have been very active in helping, the, helping to boost uh, uh, Russian civil society and, and different NGOs. Uh, he was released two years ago, actually, it's not, not less than, uh, yes, November 2013, uh, where he, uh, he was uh, uh, released from uh, Putin's prison. Uh, the problem with Kolokovsky is not what it did in the past. You know, my current uh, disagreement with him, though we agree on many things, is the way he has been treating, for instance, Crimea's problem. And uh, that's a fundamental disagreement between several uh, prominent uh, members of Russian opposition because I believe you know, that the most effective policy fighting dictatorship is a moral one. So following the lines of Andrei Sakharov, um, great, you know, uh, one of the greatest dissidents and uh, human rights activists in, in the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, uh, I cannot understand how you can separate crimes committed by regime inside the country with the crimes committed by Putin's reg regime outside of the country. Annexation of Crimea is a crime. And people who did it, they must be tried by the international law for violations of also the Russian laws. Because Russia signed with Ukraine so many treaties after 1991 recognizing Ukrainian borders. All Russian presidents, including Vladimir Putin, Yeltsin, Putin, Medvedev, if you can call him a president, but he was technically there, you know, so it's the, um, uh, signed the treaties with Ukraine, different treaties uh, ra ratified by every Russian parliament. So uh, annexation of Crimea, the, the, the war in, 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 in the east of Ukraine, constant attempts to, to, to destroy Ukrainian statehood, those are crimes uh, that you know, must, be, must be tried by you know, both international and Russian law. And pretending that Crimean problem should be treated separately because many Russians supported that, I think it's just, it's, it's, it's morally wrong. Thank you. Could you describe uh, Putin's uh, policies towards Israel and how that plays into his goals? Um, I think Putin is very opportunistic because, you know, for him, Israel, I believe these days, is an opportunity to create chaos and a war in the Middle East. He needs war in the Middle East. Oil prices are too low. $50 a barrel will give him probably another two years, you know, just to run with this expenditure. So he'll run out of money. And oil can go even down. So big war in the Middle East could, he expects, could push prices up. Um, it's not enough, you know, to put I Iraq or Syria ablaze. Right now, despite the war in the region, oil prices are still there. So I believe Putin's dream is actually to push ISIS, Islamic State, south, down south to Saudi Arabia, because you have Sunnis and Sunnis fighting each other. That could be his dream. Uh, that's why Russian planes and Iranian forces not fighting ISIS. They're fighting uh, American-backed uh, um, opposition, trying to prop up uh, Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and Israel is next door. Uh, you have Hezbollah and Hamas, Iranian proxies, you know, surrounding Israel from the north and the south, so in, from Gaza and from Lebanon. And uh, any moment Israel is engaged, if, if the state of Israel can no longer tolerate some kind of actions near, near its borders, uh, that could be another uh, triumph for Putin. Because Middle East uh, um, at war uh, will eventually put oil prices up, but also will create more chaos. Because when you look at these refugees, for instance, you know, it's also a, a big uh, strategic advantage for Vladimir Putin. Because these refugees, most of them, are trying to uh, uh, reach out European shores. What happens when refugees appearing in Germany or in other European countries? It, it helps. Uh, 
nationalist groups, ultra-right wing groups in Europe to gain more power because people are frustrated. And uh, more refugees uh, in Europe, more power to, this, to the nationalist groups who are openly, these groups, these groups are supporting Putin and Putin openly supporting them. Uh, so if they gain some power, they can eventually vote to lift up European sanctions against Russia. So Putin has been playing this game and he knows that more chaos he creates, better are his chances to promote his, his clandestine agenda. Thank you. Mr. Kasparov, здравствуйте. I'll have two questions, um, one being personal and one being political. First is that um, this year we had a movie about the chess legend Bobby Fischer. Um, Pawn Sacrifice. Tobi yeah, Pawn Sacrifice starring Tobey Maguire. In the future, is it possible for us to see a movie about, the, about Gary Kasparov, you know, considering, <laughs> considering your chess career and human rights activism? Uh, I don't know. I think everything is possible. So actually, I have to say that the movie distorted many historical facts, but I have to say that it was a, it was a, overall balance was positive because it created, recreated the atmosphere uh, of um, chess enthusiasm in this country in 1972, and also the importance of the struggle between this, the boy from Brooklyn and the Soviet chess machine. So it's, again, I, I, would, I would give it, you know, A minus. So as the, so I think it's, it's uh, it was, it was I, the reason I say A minus is because they just changed history voluntarily. So just, you know, mixing, you know, uh, different players, but, and it was a bit difficult for me just since I knew all of them. So it's, um, and uh, by the way, Schreiber who played Spassky, he had tremendous physical resemblance. Well, Tobey Maguire didn't look like Bobby Fischer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have to say, uh, yeah, and the other one will be about Turkey, my country. Um, we had our latest elections and Erdogan took control over again, but in, the, in our country we got the same concerns over Erdogan as like yours about Putin. Um, have you been close with the Turkish agenda? What do you think about latest elections and what do you think about Turkey's future? Look, um, I do understand that Erdogan potentially could become dangerous. Uh, the reason I would caution you against comparing him to Putin because not, uh, what, six months ago, the previous elections, yeah. uh, the ruling party lost elections. These things never happened in Putin's Russia. <laughs> yes, so, so uh, uh, yes, Erdogan can pose a threat to the Turkish democracy because definitely he wants to rule forever. Um, but uh, hopefully, you know, again, it's the state there. There are many forces that could actually prevent it from happening. Again, the active role of Europeans and Americans could, act, could um, could uh, um, limit Erdogan's ambitions because I think it's many in Turkey real realize that joining Europe, you know, uh, and becoming part of the of the European market and European political system could be far more important than having Erdogan's party in power forever. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank you. I was very impressed with your intellectual and entertainment presentation. Do you remember Lee Iacocca? Yes. He said, where have all the leaders gone? When do you think we're going to find another one, like John Kennedy, who talks and walks the talk? Um, um, yeah, I think it's, it's, look, you have what you have now. But it's, it's, I think it's, it's, it's not just about finding the right person, but it's also about having sort of the right mood of the electorate. It's at the end of the day, look, Obama was elected and re-elected by 70 million Americans each time. It's a fact, you know, even today, you know, this disastrous presidency is still supported by many purely on a partisan basis. I think it's, it's the, the mood has to change. John Kennedy was a product of his time. And, it just, and uh, I pointed out that these debates, it was amazing to see that this, the, the country was ready for this new challenge because this country was led by great presidents, you know, it had Harry Truman's agenda that Kennedy actively promoted and developed. But uh, in order to, um, you know, to move forward with, you know, uh, with, the, with uh, great presidents like Truman, Kennedy, Reagan, of course, for me, uh, I think it's, again, you need to make sure people are ready and willing to, not just to make sacrifices, but to, 
to appreciate the role America played, is playing, and will be playing in, 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 uh, um, in the global affairs. So um, hopefully these debates will help, but um, again, it takes time. And um, um, as I said, you know, you don't looking- You think they have so far, do you? Look, again, I- All uh, a bunch of baloney, the, the two-party system doesn't work. Look, I don't know, I'm just, I'm, I'm you ask me, you ask too much, you know. Thank so, you very much. Yes, for my, for my taste, maybe you can have, you know, uh, a party that could be fiscal conservative and uh, social liberal, but it's this, it's, uh, again, I'm not making decisions here, please. Good evening, my name is Alicia Dressman. I'm a nuclear policy specialist. My focus is U.S.-Russian strategic forces, so you can see I've been busy lately. First of all, I'd like, like to make a specific comment. The Buddhist Pest Memorandum that you discussed was I not a treaty, and it's not. They're so Russians being the semantic warriors and the evil thereof, they violated a memorandum and not a treaty, and so in the eyes of international law, it's different. The trilateral agreement where U Ukraine switched out its nuclear weapons for reassurances that Russia wouldn't storm into Crimea in 1994, that was not a treaty. It's just a little, little point. Um, I'm going to talk about the apparatus. I want to understand why Sergei Shagu, current Russian defense minister, could rise, could survive in the Yeltsin administration and, you know, in his little potsy role as minister of emergencies, and then come into Putin's administration. Obviously, there's an apparatus that has sustained from the Yeltsin administration through Medvedev now to Putin that supports ministers that are either corrupt, dysfunctional, et cetera, and how will that apparatus change if in the future, your lifetime, Putin is replaced by Glazia, Vergozin, Shaigu, whoever? So that's my question. If I need to rephrase it, then no, I can. I don't Thank think you. Putin will be replaced by Vergozin, Glazia, Shaigu, the name's totally unknown for the audience, but uh, as an expert, you know, you can appreciate this, this response. Uh, it's the end of Putin's uh, regime uh, will mean the end of the system that has been built over, over the 16 years because Putin is a spine of the system. And so, as I said, a full-blown one-man dictatorship. And you can hardly expect that when he goes down, the system survives. It's not about you know, taking one man and putting another man. This, it's, it's, it's too far away now from the, from the station where you know, we could still leave this train and just to take another one. So that's why, uh, and by the way, you said corrupt, this corrupt, this not corrupt. Corruption in Putin's Russia is a system. Anybody who is so high in power is corrupt beyond, beyond imagination. So they all are mega rich people. So, and uh, I think that's one of, the pro one of the challenges for new regime in Russia would be actually to go after this uh, stolen money and just to, um, to bring it back home to the Russian treasury. But I, I can't help myself but not responding to what you said. It's not Russians who are semantic warriors, but this I was talking about bureaucrats. No, by the way, you're talking about bureaucrats. semantic warriors no. in Russia. This is yes. not about, it's a 1994 memorandum in Budapest, and I have to, just to give a uh, few lines about this, this, this um, non-treaty, because it's quite amazing. I heard about this recently about Iranian nuclear deal. It's not treaty. So it's not, you don't have to ratify it, it uh, uh, with, with simple majority. So, and, and one uh, Democrats even filibuster the debate. But it, there are certain things about credibility and morality that is important. The entire, I, uh, the entire idea of, the, of this memorandum, which by the way included eventually also Kazakhstan and Belarus, because the Soviet nukes uh, have been spread in, 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 in four countries, Russia proper, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. And uh, by the time this memorandum has been signed, under heavy pressure from Americans, you know that, Bill Clinton, the President of the United States, forced Ukrainians to give up, can you guess the size of Ukraine, Ukrainian nuclear arsenal in 2000? Any ideas how many warheads they had? Just quickly. 2,000. 2,000 nuclear warheads, more than China, England, and France combined. Why they did it? Because America, Bill Clinton, United Kingdom, John Major, signed, of course it was non-binding. It was not a treaty. It was a memorandum. Ukrainians signed it, and they were guaranteed territorial integrity. Not treaty. You, you, you don't have to react when Russia violated it. But I think it just, it, it, it's one of the 
defining moments in history where your reputation is destroyed. Because if the signature of the United States president is worthless, who is going to rely on, on the words of any administration? Many countries for decades, if you know that, relied on Americans' nuclear umbrella and American protection. Now, if things are getting worse and worse, so how long will it take for South Korea or Japan to get nuclear if they believe that the United States is no longer there to defend them? How many months or, I don't know, in the case of Japan, maybe weeks, will it take for them to, 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 to develop nukes if they decide that they have to defend themselves against not Putin, China, or North Korea, South Korea conflict? How long will it take for Saudis to buy nukes from Pakistan? Probably they already did it. So United Arab Emirates uh, declared, I think, months ago that if Iran had rights to en enrich uranium, so they, they had the, the, the same rights. So this is the problem that is, you can pretend that you know, the world doesn't need a policeman and doesn't need someone who will, you know, who will enforce you know, um, uh, certain rules and, and, and treaties but, or memorandums, but you know, chaos is an alternative. And uh, what Putin did in Ukraine, in my view, you know, sent a message to every thug in the world that you can start changing the you know, world order and if Putin is in a position to defy Americans, so uh, is, is, you know, all bets are off. Thank you. I didn't realize it was the last question.